you alluded to like there was more than one time that you had something questionable that made you think you might yeah. have might have go ahead. The, what, was, what else did you find? The other the other time it was in 2014 in the, in uh, I think it was in July of 2014 and I was out west of Nordegg in the same kind of area I was filming in later on and it was in the middle of the night I kind of woke up and I was I, I think I was half asleep so I'm not sure to this day if it was a dream or not but I, I thought I woke up and I heard footsteps walk by my tent probably about 20 feet in front of my tent and they were heavy footsteps there was about three or four of them and then after I heard the footsteps there was a, a grunt like a uh, like and then I kind of just fell back asleep and didn't even think about it until I don't know probably like 24 hours later well I do appreciate the fact that you, you're willing to admit that it could have either have been a dream <laughs> or it, it, without alluding to the fact that you know you're not saying that this was Sasquatch and that's something I, I have come to appreciate from <laughs> those that when someone says I had a Bigfoot encounter experience and they go on to describe it and yet there could be other possible explanations uh, something I've come to appreciate I mean in fact I was up at the Olympics this weekend and we, we, we had some interesting stuff happen uh, heard by multiple individuals and um but no one was claiming it was Sasquatch. It was just very odd, given the circumstances and everything else. And uh, that's why I enjoy talking to people like you and, and working with people that I work with, is that they're very skeptical. Because uh, these things, you know, your mind can play tricks with you. And um, there's a lot of known animals that do act and behave um, that get, you know, in this in this fashion that Sasquatch gets pinned to. Um, but... Uh, of course, there's a lot of unexplainable things that just doesn't match anything. So uh, I do appreciate that. And, uh, I mean, your, your documentary um, reflects that, right? I mean, it really reflects that you're not out to say everything with Sasquatch. You know, you're, you're reliving your dad's experience. You're, you're talking to individuals, and you're going out there. It's, it's wild, man, your search for Sasquatch. And uh, um, that's something that... I think makes for a great documentary uh, because you're basically just going with the facts. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I told myself when I first started, like my goal is not to prove to the world that Bigfoot exists. I knew there was a very slim chance I'd be able to do anything like that, but it was more to prove to myself that it might be out there and, and just to see what I can, what I could find for myself and. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to know. I've always been fascinated by it, so it was something I had to learn more about, and it's a mystery. I love mysteries, and it's a, a big adventure, so it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So and where do you stand now with, with, with Sasquatch? You, I mean, what's the, the probability in your head of its existence? Now, after the fact, mm -hmm. I'm more leaning to it, like, being an actual thing. I released Wildman My Search for Sasquatch back in September of 2016. And in Wildman My Search for Sasquatch, you basically see two different expeditions. One on Vancouver Island at a place called Henry Lake, which is near Port Alberni. And the second expedition is in Alberta, near Nordic. What I'm trying to do with this short film is to kind of go over the things that happened in Wildman, My Search for Sasquatch, and to kind of go over things that you don't see in the film. So I'm very happy to share that with you, and hopefully you enjoy it. It actually took more than two expeditions to find, you know, something worth showing. Spent a lot of time near Rocky Mountain House and around Nordic doing multiple trips. I took a jet boat out onto the North Saskatchewan River and was looking for footprints along the shores. Um, I went on a winter expedition where I had an Argo, which is like an all-terrain amphibious vehicle, and I was kind of exploring around the Nordegg area, similar in the way that you see in the film. However, there was lots of snow, and uh, it made the trip really challenging, and it was harder to cover lots of ground. I think one of the biggest questions we need to ask is, what is a Sasquatch? 
You know, there's so many different theories. Most people think it is a type of primate and is more animalistic. People think it could be Gigantopithecus or a descendant of Gigantopithecus, which was a primate that existed hundreds of thousands of years ago and is now known to be extinct. Some people think it could be closer to a human and is very, very intelligent and smart and can work things out in its mind in a way that a normal animal can't, you know, and it has curiosity and it can look at things and, and make judgments on things and it's, you know, able to make decisions based on what it sees. You know, there's some other people that even think it could be related to aliens and extraterrestrials and UFOs and, you know, the theories just get, get very, very wild. Some people think it could be an interdimensional being where it can slip in and out of our plane of existence and that's why it's so hard to find is that it can just disappear on a whim. I like to think of it as a type of primate that hasn't been discovered yet. Maybe it's somewhere in between gorilla and man, you know, it, so it has the animalistic traits of a gorilla but a lot of the intelligence of a human. So I, I kind of imagine it in between there. Vancouver Island was creepy. It was very creepy. It was secluded. I drove for many hours going down these logging roads, which were super sketchy. Uh, I'd come across big logging trucks that were transporting full loads, and, and the roads were so narrow that there wasn't a lot of room to get by them. And on some sides of the road, it was like a sheer drop off, so there was nowhere to go. The whole process of getting to Henry Lake was just treacherous. What you don't see in the film is that it actually took two attempts to get to Henry Lake. And the first time, it was very, very stormy out. It was actually the remnants of a tropical storm blowing through. There was a moment where I took the wrong road and I kind of drove up into a, a site where they were logging. And uh, there was a bunch of burn piles around. And when I was driving into that site, out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw something run by, like a black humanoid figure. and it sent chills up my spine and I got breathing kind of heavy because it, it creeped me out and it startled me and I just stopped my vehicle and sat there for a few minutes because of course the one thing on my mind when I'm out there is Sasquatch you know was it a Sasquatch is it a Sasquatch I don't know um, and I was probably just imagining it so that kind of got my heart racing it got me worried I turned around got back on the right track made it cl pretty close to the lake and that's when the lightning started, uh, just intense lightning strikes, wouldn't have been more than 50 feet away, like the thunder was instant, it was so loud and it made everything just vibrate. Eventually I got to the lake and I tried to set up my shelter, set up my tarps and the wind was so strong it just ripped the metal grommets right out of my tarps and blew them away. At that point, I decided to just pack everything up, get in my vehicle, and drive back to the nearest town, which was like three hours away, you know, and going back down these crappy logging roads. So I got back to the town, got a hotel room, and kind of gathered my wits. I spent that night in my hotel room on my computer, reading about Bigfoot, watching whatever Bigfoot videos I could find, you know, trying to amp myself up for the second attempt at Henry Lake. I want to say it was just one night there, but for some reason I think it could have been two, two nights that I stayed in the hotel after that first try. Yeah, the second time, drove back up there, got there no problems, I, I remembered how to get there, which was good. On the way up there, I'd stopped my vehicle because I could smell like an awful burning smell. Before I attempted driving there the second time, my vehicle was making weird noises. It was like an old, old beater 4x4, so I was worried about it. I pulled off the road and I noticed a stick sitting perfectly vertical against a tree. You know, like something had just placed it there. It was perfectly vertical, perfectly up and down and in perfect alignment with the tree trunk. So I thought that was kind of bizarre. It just seemed really out of place. Now the previous days there was a lot of wind blowing so maybe the wind blew the stick onto the tree. 
but the odds of it landing perfectly vertical like that and getting stuck there without breaking was just, it seemed very bizarre. I know from research I've done that Sasquatch like to mess around with sticks and use them to, to mark trails, to use them as signs, um, maybe warnings to people not to go any further, who knows. I tried to grab the stick to have a better look at it and I ended up breaking it. So uh, I wish I didn't touch it. I wish, you know, I would have just left it and then taken a bunch of photos of it and then maybe tried to grab it. But I just got too excited. I grabbed it and I broke it. So my evidence handling techniques at that point were, were very, very poor. And that was basically the only thing peculiar that happened on that trip was finding that stick evidence. There were many times where I thought I was hearing voices. I thought I could hear people talking in the distance or, you know, some kind of chatter. I'm sure I was just imagining it because I was thinking about Bigfoot the whole time. And I was alone in the middle of nowhere in an unfamiliar place. So, you know, your mind definitely plays tricks on you when you're scared. I don't doubt that at all. Another funny thing that you don't see in the film is that when I tried to leave Henry Lake at the end of my little expedition, I was driving back and I was trying to turn onto the main logging road to get out of that area and there was a big yellow gate and it was open when I went in so I thought it was just, I thought it was always open. But when I was leaving and I got to that point, the gate was closed and it was locked and on each side of the gate were very, very large, heavy concrete blocks. Eventually uh, a forestry worker came by and he was checking the locks on the gates and uh, saw me sitting there, so he ended up having to drive to the nearest town, which was again like two or three hours away at that point, and he had to get the key for the lock, so he spent half his day retrieving the key, coming back to get me. It was not the funnest day, I'll say that. expedition in the summer of 2015 was definitely the best expedition in terms of results. When we arrived on the first evening, I basically decided that we were just going to set up camp that night, we were going to prepare our gear and get ready for filming the next morning. So I had no plans to do any filming that night and it was just kind of like a preparation day, we were just kind of getting settled in. But we were all sitting around the campfire around midnight and that's when we heard a loud crack in the bush and then it sounded like something falling over like a big tree or a big tree stump or something but it was definitely like a loud crack and then something going like it made us jump out of our seats like I had a round racked in that shotgun in like a nanosecond I'd never moved so fast in my life and we all just stood there staring into the into the darkness into the woods and it was just the eeriest feeling you could hear our hearts beating like You just know that either it's a legitimate tree falling naturally or something pushed it over. And at that point, we're thinking Sasquatch. And the location we're in is well known for Sasquatch activity and is rumored to be like the number one hotspot in Canada. So out of all the trees that could have fallen in the woods that night, it was the one right by our camp that we randomly chose. Like, I mean, the odds of that happening are so low. I always thought maybe it could have been a Sasquatch trying to intimidate us and, and scare us out of the area. The next morning we found the handprints on the car window. Another, I, I think it was the most significant find of the trip was the handprints because it was just very bizarre. They were in really weird patterns. Like if you put your hands and you went like this and you just kind of pressed them against the window and it was in two different spots. And they were two different sizes of handprints. So they were small hands and the one set was even smaller, like it was from a child or something and we didn't notice them on the window before. It was a, it was a new thing in the morning and there was dermal ridges, you know, they were oily. I just remember how oily they were, you could see it. And there were black smudges on the, on the vehicle door. The vehicle was white and you could just see it plain as day, like black oil. It was very playful and it was like, you know, whatever it was wanted us to know we were there. They were giving us a sign, kind of. That's just what it felt like. 
we went out to go exploring after that. We got all our gear together and, and went out hiking. We kind of started off in the direction where we heard the tree falling. Not too far into the bush, we end up finding these, what look like tracks. They look like footprints up this really steep slope and they were shaped like a human foot. But the weird thing is, is the stride and how far apart they were going up this hill. Like they were incredibly far apart and I tried to recreate it and I just couldn't get my foot. My, I couldn't get my feet in the right spot, you know. Whatever was moving up the slope was pretty tall. Oh yeah, there's another one there. Can you make it over here somehow? Right here, we have a potential track of some sort. It is kind of like a, like a human shaped footprint. Um, probably not very fresh, I mean. Looks like it's been there for a while. Yeah. And the interesting part is that this one is behind that there, which looks like another old impression. I don't know if you can see that. And these look, it looks like it's about, what, four and a half feet apart? Something like, like that up this hill. Big step up a hill. If it is, I mean, it, they do look like footprints. Is there anything else? Uh, I guess we'll have to look. You know, if I try to replicate that stride, I mean, like this is a huge step uphill and it's all the way up here. So I don't think a human being is going to be able to do that. I guess we'll carry on and see if we can find any more of these impressions. Follow them. We continued up the slope and it kind of leveled out and flattened out at the top. And that's where we found the best track, which was very clear. And uh, you could actually make out the toes and the heel. And it was kind of in the shape of what you'd think a juvenile Sasquatch print looks like. You know, if you've seen the track casts of a juvenile print, the toes are kind of splayed out. And it wasn't very long, it was around 12, 13 inches, but it was definitely in the shape of a juvenile Sasquatch track, you know, which also matches up to the handprints on the car window, which were also kind of small. So I always thought that, you know, maybe the handprints we found on the car window were from the same creature that left the footprints. There were other tracks too. We found a couple tracks in an old riverbed. Um, very old, you know, kind of hard to make out, but definitely the same shape as all the other tracks. Another thing that I didn't show in the film is an event that happened with the trail cameras. The first day we went out exploring, I set up a trail cam on a tree in our camp. And in front of the camera, we put a, a tree stump that we were using as a stool. Uh, we put that in front of the camera and we set an apple on the tree stump. We left camp at around two o'clock in the afternoon and got back, I wanna say around four. There was a bunch of different clips that were recorded with the trail camera. The wind that day was moving a lot of branches and it kept setting the camera off. But you get a bunch of clips where you can see the apple and then all of a sudden the next clip, there's no apple, the apple's gone. And then the next clip it's gone and the next clip we come back. And when we got back, we actually found the apple on the ground beside the stump and it had a big bite taken out of it. Sometime between two different clips, the apple was picked up and a bite was taken out of it. Or an animal came along and started nibbling on it. I don't know, it looked like a bite. It couldn't have occurred more than a half hour before we arrived, like from 3.24 to, I think it was 3.55 or, I don't know, just before four is when it happened. So it wasn't too long before we got back. Trail cameras are a good tool but a lot of people think that Sasquatch can outsmart them. And you know, they think that Sasquatch can, you know, pick up on the infrared beam and, and detect these cameras and they know what they're there for. I feel like if something would have came along and grabbed the apple and taken a bite out of it, or even if just an animal came and it had a bite out of it, that the motion sensor would have picked up and it would have filmed it. But no, it's just a, a gap in time where at, in one clip, 
the apples there, and then the next clip, the apples gone. It was, it just didn't add up. So down by our camp down there is uh, three wild horses and actually walked through earlier this morning and uh, looks like they're coming back now. They're going through the river. Check this out. Okay, we've just been up on the ridge, like minding our own business. We've been watching these two birds doing their thing over there. And like three times we've heard this noise. It sounded really close from like, I don't know, the first one was like over here. Yeah, it sounded like ish. a bonus. And then maybe another one over in the trees there, but I, it, it was like, oh, oh, like something along those lines. So we're just gonna leave the camera on with the microphone and see if we can pick it up. But we that was three times we've heard it. Mosquitoes have died down. documentary I also wanted to release a segment that did not make it into the original Wildman film. I wanted to release it but it just made the film too long and it wasn't necessary to have it in there so. This is the Wildman expedition of the Grave Flats area near Nordegg. Well, we arrived at our site for the weekend, and uh, well, actually, we didn't make it to the original place we wanted to go to. It's quite a ways further up the road, but there is a lot of snow here. As you can see, we uh, tried to put chains on the tires of the truck, but the chains are a little too big, and it just didn't work out. So we decided to pull off the road here and, and make camp in this forest for the night. It's a better spot as any, I mean, just as good as the, the other place, but at least this way we can stay close to the truck just in case. I think what the plan is, is to build a shelter. And once we do that, we're going to unload the Argo and we're going to rip up this road and check out the original spot we wanted to go to and uh, we'll also find a place to put our trail cameras it's 
doesn't like starting in the cold. This is where our, our camp will be and it's actually already a used campsite so we're not really destroying any of the forest well this is our camp not too shabby just a basic lean-to shelter hopefully the heat from this fire that will light will give us a little bit of warmth I don't think it'll be too cold tonight we're gonna head out right away and set up our trail cams. We'll come back, light the fire, cook dinner, and uh, maybe make some noises, see if we can attract anything. Try and make it to that corner where the sun's shining there. Sure. And see what's around the corner. And then check the GPS and see how far we are. Yeah. Sounds like a good plan. Probably just see what's around that next corner there. Maybe there's an opening we can see down. Yeah, it looked kind of flat in there, yeah. especially where that tree structure was. Mm -hmm. Like this could be a good spot up here even to put the trail cam up on one of those trees. It's kind of weird. I almost want to just kind of destroy it to see if there's anything inside it. Kick it? Like, huh? Kick it? Yeah, like just to see if it's... But that's what it looks like. It looks like it rolls down here. It's like a snowball. You can almost see a little... Okay. I don't know. Is there a tree branch or something down? Yeah, I don't know. Kick it? May as well, just to see. Because if it's pure snow, that that's bizarre. Yeah, with a hole got, in it. We got pictures of it, so. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a freaking tire. Is it just snow? Is yeah. It, maybe the Sasquatch made it. It came down that hill because you can see the mud in here. It started off as a snowball and then just sat here and the sun melted a hole through it. It's strong, too. Like, it's solid. has tracks as big as these snowshoes so there's it's no mistaking them yeah you never see it but i never seen them though except they'd be so far apart yeah this is a ufo holy crap <laughs> sun shining off the side of a plane or a ufo Aliens. See, they're communicating, they're spying on us. Communicating to the Bigfoots. <laughs> Letting them know where we're at. This 
in that cloud now, eh? Yeah. Interesting. See, that's the thing, like... Oh, you can see it now. That plane... That little brief amount of time we saw it, and by the time I turned the camera towards it, set my camera to the right exposure, and focused it, it was gone. Can you imagine a Bigfoot running across the road? Oh, uh, you know, you'd have, you'd never catch him. No. Do you hear that? I guess that's the explanation. What? You hear like a ringing in my ears. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. No, I don't hear anything. It's not the camera, I don't think. That was weird in this year. Riding the yard with <laughs> I find it so loud in there. Hopefully something walks through and I can get it on, on film. Wake up to growling sounds. Pretty cold waking up today. It was a cold night. So we were driving along this trail. It's actually a road, but it's just totally covered in snow. And uh, I looked out. And I noticed this tree break. And this is typical of what you would see. Look at this. It does kind of seem out of place. This is the only one I've seen so far along this road and we've been on it for 
probably about three kilometers but I'm gonna keep my eye out for for any more of them and if they're all pointing in the same direction maybe it, like it could mean something maybe to mark their territory mark trailheads for them I don't know there's nothing else around here but I'm also gonna take a few pictures of it and I'm not gonna to touch it this time and break the break or damage the evidence the last time I was out I I touched it and broke felt really bad it is a very clean break too almost like somebody grabbed it right here and right here and just snapped it and it's over six feet over six feet high where the break is some old man's beard sitting in it not Bigfoot hair it is a pretty sturdy tree too I mean it would take a lot of strength to snap this but then again it could be nothing it could just be snapped from some kind of natural occurrence I don't know first piece of evidence of this trip so far See any Sasquatches? Yep. Bitch, they're all up on that hill. Up ahead. That big hill. Probably. They'd be easy to spot against the snow. I think it's gonna be a gonna be a cold night. No footprints of any animal in here. So. Don't see anything lurking. Hmm. Snowshoes are too small. Keep just sinking down. Gets pretty tiring. The weather's really picking up. There's a storm coming through here. Bigfoot doesn't want to talk to me. Battery's starting to run low. Absolute baloney, you know, and, and they proved it. Yeah. And he 
still wouldn't admit that he gave him some bear hair. I mean, the guy should know what bear hair is. I mean, he's a bear hunter. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not like, exactly. oh, whoops, I forgot the Sasquatch hair in, the, in my glove box. I accidentally gave you grizzly bear. He's an experienced Yeah, like he's an experienced outdoorsman, so it was pretty obvious he was just BSing. And he's a liar, and he's, you know, like, right to the end, he still never admitted that. Like, because blood on your boots, I mean, they're going to find that. That's, there's murders that happen all the time where they look for that. People want to believe, and they run, and their mansions run wild. And then there's the other people that need a purpose in life, so they're willing to screw around and create false. Like, that guy was obviously just trying to attract attention to himself. And for a while, he was on top of the world because he was the only guy that shot at But now, once that happens, I think his life changed quite a bit. Yeah. Because now he's just a liar. <laughs> There's the crazy guy that thinks he, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. When people see him now, he's not going to be known as the guy that killed the Bigfoot. He's going to be known as the guy that lied. If you see something that you cannot explain in your own mind, then you're, you're going to be swayed the other way. Yeah. Like I can see something, look at something and go, holy crap, that was no bear thing of standing up, and walking the And then I'd be like, well, man, I gotta, that's, now we're looking at something, you know, like, Yeah. But I'm just the type of person, until I see that for myself, I don't really take it at face value. What people tell me, because there's so many things that are misconstrued. That being said, there's there are credible people too. Like I mean, I'm sure like that guy in BC that you were supposed to meet up with. I mean, would he really dedicate his whole life to looking for Bigfoot if he didn't find some kind of real evidence? So you know, you, you see things like that where you this guy's a professional who has credibility in his work for other things. And so then you think, well, gee, maybe maybe there really is something. On the other hand. There's a lot of nutty professors on there too, right? Like, it yeah. could be a just one of these little weird hoaxes or little things that he enjoys doing on a, as a hobby. Yeah. You don't know. And now with like the advent of digital enhancing and all that, it's gotten to the point, like I say, you, you cannot tell whether it's real or not. Like it doesn't. Footage can look absolutely 100% real. You can look at it and say, "You bet, that's that is a Bigfoot." Yet, it is possible to make it look like fool 99. Like, I mean, I'm not a professional. I don't. When I look at something and I I believe that it's real, it's it's based on my own perception. I'm not a professional. Maybe a professional can look at something and say, "No, that's definitely a digitally enhanced." And, yeah. Like those guys that created that one. I was telling you about when the woman runs out and gets hit by the car, like that looked 100% real. If that was a Bigfoot footage, then, you know, and I believed it to be credible, and I would believe in Bigfoot because it just, it looks too real. Like, you can't, can't argue it. Like, yeah. But a professional may look at that and say, oh no, that they altered the footage. You can tell by something, but I can't, I can't tell. Like if you've seen stuff that you thought was real and then found out later that it wasn't, have you ever been swayed that way. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure I have. Yeah. Like even these documentary things with these shows that they have supposed real doctors on that they're interviewing and all that. It's like, well, generally speaking, if you have doctors and professionals on a show and you're interviewing them, then you believe it to be true. Yeah. You just do because that's... But now they're coming out with shows that they have doctors and professionals on there that in the end, if you don't read the three millisecond fine print that says characters are not real or whatever, you would not know, like, because you would think, hey, yeah, these are actually... Yep. So there's all kinds of things out there to sway your perception. It's, 